What is up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Weekend Roundup here on Touchline Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the content I put out every single week. Going to do this Weekend Roundup a little bit differently. Two main topics I want to hit on that weren't specifically related to this weekend's games. But before I get into those, a couple real quick thoughts on the Premier League action over the weekend. Arsenal back on top. Liverpool, Manchester City both drop points. Arsenal get a win. Kai Havertz scores in that win. Kai Havertz is all of a sudden scoring some goals and helping in a meaningful way and contributing to this Arsenal team. That, right now, top of the Premier League. I said this with Declan Rice, and I want to revisit it now with Kai Havertz. Whether you think these guys are worth the money Arsenal paid for them or not, I happen to believe Declan Rice is. I'm still not convinced Havertz is. But whether you think they overpaid or not, if these guys are the difference between finishing second or third and winning the Premier League title, nobody is going to remember how much Arsenal paid for them. Declan Rice has been very good. Declan Rice has scored a couple really, really important goals without which Arsenal is probably not winning the Premier League right now. And Kai Havertz is now contributing some important goals as well. It doesn't mean he's all of a sudden actually worth what Arsenal paid and is living up to his full potential. But Mikel Arteta saw something and is getting something out of him now. His confidence is actually starting to return. He's looking like somebody who can play an important role for this team. It, we are getting closer every week to a world in which these goals and the contributions of these two players could actually be the difference between Arsenal lifting the trophy and Arsenal finishing second. And if that is the case, it doesn't matter whether they actually perform to the price tags or not. You, this team needed to be elevated. They needed to find ways to bring in additional players to take one more step if they were really going to challenge for the title. They ran out of gas last season. They didn't have the depth they needed. Jurian Timber was also supposed to be part of that. Obviously, he got injured really, really early. So basically, it's these two guys that are supposed to be the difference makers. And so far, they have both made a difference. How much of a difference ultimately still have to be decided to be still to be determined. But they are contributing. Don't get caught up in the price tags. Nobody is going to be worried about that if they're playing a big part and have some defining moments, which they have already had, to a team that goes on and wins the Premier League. It just doesn't matter whether they overpaid or not. If that's the difference, you pay whatever price you need to. The second thing, one of the big news stories, very scary, Tom Locklear collapsing during Luton Town's game with Bournemouth. The game then rightly is postponed and, and halted. First of all, bravo to everybody for prioritizing the right things here. Of course, it was a fairly easy decision, but still got to give credit. And I want to acknowledge that the medical personnel did a great job immediately stepping up. Luton Town has said that Locklear went into cardiac arrest and is now stable in the hospital. Terrific news. They were able to help. That's obviously the most important thing is Locklear's physical health. But also not making players go and then finish this game. The mental health side of this for everybody else who is on the field, for all of these Luton Town players who have now seen this happen twice in the span of less than seven months to Town Locklear. So it was reassuring to see the right things being prioritized here. We don't know exactly what happened. I don't want to sit here and speculate or say that these two incidents are connected because I haven't seen anything that actually suggests that's the case. But Tom Locklear collapsed. He then underwent a heart procedure, was given the all clear. 
and then went into cardiac arrest on the field for the second time in 2023. There are obviously questions that need to be answered and hopefully the, the tests and things that are being run by the medical professionals right now are going to give some answers to this, to these questions of why did this happen again? Because it was not supposed to. Nobody was talking about some kind of added risk because of the the first incident and the procedure that Locklear underwent. That was supposed to fix it. Again, maybe they're completely unrelated and it's just a terrible coincidence and a terrible series of events. Speculation doesn't help anything. So I'm just going to leave it at that, that I hope both for Locklear and him moving forward as he makes decisions about next steps and just as a athletic community that is still trying to learn more about these things, why they happen, how to prevent them, that some clear answers are forthcoming that help Locklear make better decisions, that help everybody in the medical world make better decisions when it comes to the health of athletes. So thankfully, he is stable. Again, bravo to everybody for the way that this was handled. Very, very scary scenes. But the outcome could have been even worse. So thankful that Tom Locklear is in the hospital and stable. Two things I want to focus on here. One, again, not necessarily specifically related to the weekend, but over the weekend, I finished the U.S. Women's National Team documentary series. Netflix, it's called Under Pressure. And I did want to give some thoughts because I have a lot of them. And this documentary was getting a lot of coverage and a lot of hype because it was supposed to be this inside look at the World Cup that went wrong. The first thing I will say is that anybody who actually follows the U.S. Women's National Team closely and is a true fan of this team is going to be disappointed by this documentary. It became abundantly clear very quickly that Netflix made the arrogant decision to attempt to capitalize on the U.S. Women's National Team three-peating and all of the excitement that comes every time this team wins a major tournament every two, four years, where they become the focus of attention. And all these people who don't watch these players week in and week out, who don't necessarily watch every game this team plays, get really, really excited. World Cup fever, Olympic fever, parades, all of that good stuff. And so the team becomes very, very marketable. And all of a sudden, you've got all these people who want to watch this documentary. Except, obviously, the U.S. didn't win the World Cup. So then Netflix still had to make this documentary. And instead of shifting the focus and really doing the deep dive on what went wrong and what happened, they decided to stick with the original script as much as they could. And so you see things like Meg Lanahan explaining what a cap is. Abby Wambach explaining how World Cups are formatted. You see things like Christy Mewis being with her fiancé Sam Kerr during Australia's run in the final episode of the documentary instead of actually taking that time to reflect. And about the only answers you get from players are Alex Morgan and Lindsay Horan saying we weren't good enough. Nobody needs a documentary to tell them that. We all watched. And so this was just clearly not catered to the people that actually focus on this team and and are invested in this team. This was catered to the people that are going to, that come in every couple years, watch the major tournaments, get all excited about the team and want to learn more about these players. And that's fine. But it was this missed opportunity to really investigate and actually ask the hard questions. There were no new interviews that I can remember about all the things Chloe Lloyd said. They took footage from the press conferences from the World Cup, but there were no reflections afterward about what she said. And by the way, she said those things before the Sweden game. It was immediately after the Portugal game, the ones that really went viral. 
And then they went out and you know, they performed much better, but they went out and lost the next game. There was no new information about that. There was a whole tribute at the end to Megan Rapino, which is not an inherently bad thing. She's absolutely deserving of it. That doesn't have anything to do with the World Cup. But they need to fill this documentary because plan A went out the window and there it didn't seem like there was a plan B in terms of, okay, if they don't win, here's how we're handling it and this is the way that it's going to go. And so are there some interesting parts? Sure. Was it a cool idea to focus on three players who aren't as prominent, who were on the bubble in three very different stages of their career with three different, very different backstories? Yeah, I was a fan of that idea, learning more about Alyssa Thompson, Christy Mewis, and Lynn Williams. But if you're coming into this expecting to actually learn about the inner workings of this team, what went on at the World Cup, I don't, I just, I don't think you're going to take anything away from this. And it was a lot of placing all the blame on Vlako Antonovsky, the way that this was framed. And I certainly have my criticisms. Also, the players were still on the field and couldn't score against Portugal and played that poorly and survived by the width of the post to even get to the group, to get to the knockout stage. So I was incredibly disappointed. There was a real opportunity here to do a deep dive. And of course, it's going to be harder to sell that than to, hey, we want to celebrate you winning another World Cup. But it, to me, it was very, very underwhelming. So I wanted to, to give those thoughts, maybe warn some people. This is, this is not for you if you are truly invested in this team. This is for the casual fan. And that, that's not inherently a bad thing. But we do need to call it what it is. And it was an attempt to capitalize on a three-peat when everybody was going to be talking about them and then that three-peat didn't happen and it just seemed like Netflix didn't know what to do after that. The second thing. On Friday, Major League Soccer announced that its teams will not be participating in the 2024 Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup. The announcement basically cited fixture congestion is the reason why. Which is a valid issue. LAFC should not, I think it was 53 games this season. LAFC should not be playing that many games. Just like Liverpool and Manchester City should not be playing as many games as they do when they're fighting on four fronts and going to the Club World Cup. The, you know, Philadelphia Union going to the semifinals of the League's Cup, getting to the playoffs, playing in CONCACAF Champions League, getting to the semifinals, too many games, 100%. But pointing to the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup as the reason why is ridiculous. That is not the issue. The issue is that Major League Soccer now has teams participating in not one, not two, but three different continental competitions. The CONCACAF Champions League, the Leagues Cup, and the Champions Cup, which is still there. I know it's only a one-off game, so it's not that big of a deal. But it's still another midweek game that somebody has to play. If you're actually worried about fixture congestion, don't stop your season for a month to go play more games against League MX teams. But this isn't about fixture congestion. That's not the concern. The concern is money and marketing. And so, the oldest tournament, the one thing that actually has history when it comes to soccer in this country is now being destroyed because it's not as cool as Messi playing against Club America or whoever. Domestic cup competitions are a fundamental part of this sport. It is infuriating that Major League Soccer was arrogant enough to just disregard all of that and to be so blatantly focused on the money.
Number one, some of your teams came from this tournament, specifically FC Cincinnati. Number two, you are now taking your teams out of the one competition that actually connects everybody within the sport in this country. How cool is it when Inter Miami has to go play the Birmingham Legion? And DC United is playing a semi-pro team or whoever it was. And oh, by the way, do the starters play in those games? No, they don't. So you're not even actually reducing the amount of games that the most important players on these teams play. You're reducing the overall number of games. But the ones they're playing are the ones that you're prioritizing. So it's not even going to make that much of a difference. And teams get upset in the first couple rounds when MLS teams enter anyway, because that's how cup competitions work. The other part of this. If you're that concerned, how about you actually rewrite the roster regulations so that teams have enough depth to fight on two, three, four fronts in a season? These rosters are not designed to let teams focus on multiple competitions. I don't have a lot of sympathy for LAFC because they spend as much money as just about anybody in the league and they can just have a situation where Gareth Bale and Giorgio Chiellini are available off the bench in MLS Cup. But they would have been better equipped to handle all of these finals they were playing in and maybe actually prioritize the regular season if they weren't so hamstrung by what they could do in terms of building their roster. That's the other... There are multiple ways to fix this. None of them have anything to do with the Open Cup. But like I said, it's not about actually fixing the problem because that's not the problem. The problem is that the Open Cup isn't making enough money. It's not generating enough interest. It's disgusting. That's what it is. I could keep ranting about this, but I'm just going to keep saying the same things over and over. Major League Soccer should be ashamed of itself. I have always been a strong supporter of the Open Cup. I love the Open Cup. I've said that before on this YouTube channel. It is also another opportunity to go win a trophy. And it's specifically an opportunity for teams that aren't necessarily going to be factors or at least favorites come playoff time, come CONCACAF Champions League, which is now getting renamed too. But you get the point. It's Orlando City winning their first MLS trophy two seasons ago. And oh, by the way, playing a USL team to do it. It's the Houston Dynamo. Having something tangible to take away from this incredible turnaround that Pat Onstant and Ben Olsen have orchestrated this season. That's why the Open Cup matters. It matters because it's the community tournament. It's the one where everybody has a chance. And we'll see what happens moving forward. But I don't, I don't see them allowing teams to re-enter. They're only going to find more ways to stick more games in there against League MX teams, especially when Messi's here. It's disgusting. That's where I'm going to leave it. It just takes away some of your faith in sporting institutions. It really does. That's how dis how infuriated I am by this. That you want to believe it's about at least something more than money. And then stuff like this happens. And stuff like Live Golf happens. And you can go down the list. And you... It's just this cold, harsh reminder that ultimately people can say whatever they want, but at the end of the day, not only is money prioritized, but people are willing to give up an awful lot in order to make a little bit more of it. And now the U.S. soccer community, the Open Cup, 
USL teams that don't get to play MLS teams, MLS squad players, and the teams themselves are paying the price because they don't get to go compete for this awesome trophy with all of these really cool stories that instead of giving up on, maybe MLS should have done a better job marketing. That is all for this edition of the Weekend Roundup. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to hit the subscribe button, and I will see you next time.